All right, so this lesson is about hydro hydroponics. What's hydro mean? Water, water. And how about ponics? Or if we go back to the Greek, ponos. Ponos. To work. Good guess, though. To work. So in hydroponics, the water does the work. Now, in order to understand hydroponics, which is a technology for growing plants without any soil, First, we want to understand how plants grow in soil. So if I start with a little diagram here of a plant. Get that focus back. And this plant's grown up out of the dirt. Maybe it's got some leaves on it. I want you to tell me other things I need to draw on here on this picture to illustrate what's making this plant grow and what it looks like above and below ground in the conditions. So I'm a regular plant in soil and I'm probably going to need some water. H2O, some sunlight. Great. Yeah, plants like three main nutrients. What are the three primary nutrients plants like? You said one of them is, um, in fact, like if I were to buy a bag of fertilizer, you know. Yeah, the fertilizer usually has three numbers on it at the bottom. And the three number combination tells you the combination of these three these three. Uh, chemicals one is nitrogen one is phosphorus excellent and the third one is you said it I think already potassium right N P and K All right now the nitrogen is like the most important one because that's the one that's gonna um, really help things turn green right and then P and K, phosphorus and potassium, those have a slightly different role. Um, but depending on what you're trying to grow and whether or not it's a leafy green or an herb, as opposed to something like tomatoes and peppers or flowers, where there's going to be a bud or a fruit or a flower coming off of it. Um, when it's just leafy greens, we're really concerned with having a lot of nitrogen. But when you want a flower or a fruit or bud, you want to have phosphorus and potassium as well. Now, you mentioned a couple of things here. You mentioned the water. Um, is there, there, The water comes from the sky, but um, there's also groundwater, right? And uh, can you tell me anything about the water? Like, how do you measure, what are some ways to measure water? What different measurements people can take of water? Yeah, what about when you're like, you've heard the term acid rain? It's all about the pH, right? And so water has a pH, and pH sits on a scale. You know that scale? I think it's 0 to 14, right? And on each side, from 0, you know, 0 on one end and 14 on the other end, these are, these are, very acidic and very basic. Neutrals right in the middle, right at a seven. All right. Now in New Jersey, your average plants growing out in the garden, they like to have their water and their soil somewhere around this optimum level right here, like 6.5 pH. And pH stands for what? Do you know what pH stands for? 
stands for percent hydrogen. In any event. Um, all right, so we got the water. We got the pH of the water. How much sunlight does the plant like to get? Yeah, like in the summertime, right? We get 14 to 16 hours of sunlight. How do you measure light? Yeah, there's, well, there's different measurements for light. I'm thinking of one called lumens. Lumens of light. Luminosity. Lumens. Okay. What's this? What else do I need in here? What happens uh, below ground? What else is happening above ground? Yes, so the plant has roots. How big do I draw these roots? <laughs> yeah, they're good. They're going to be, they're going to probably, I, I like a general rule, it'll be like as big as the plant is above ground, you could probably bet that the root system is just as big below ground or bigger with some type of like a tap root and then a bunch of other roots coming off. And you mentioned this already, that, that these roots are looking for a few different things, right? They're looking for water. They're looking for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And when you pull up a good plant and it's real healthy, the, you, you probably won't even see most of the roots because they're so fine. They're like the size of a human hair and they're basically white or translucent. And many times they don't even stick to it. when you pull it out. They stay stuck in the soil. But it's often, it's funny to think about a tree, a big oak tree, you walk by, think about how that tree is almost the same size underground as it is above ground. And these roots are looking for MP and K. They're looking for, for water in the ground. What else are they looking? They're also looking for oxygen, though. You know when somebody gets their their front yard aerated at the beginning and end of the season and somebody comes along with a machine that pokes a bunch of holes in the ground? Yeah, what that's doing is it's plugging holes down there so that oxygen can get down to your roots. I know plants create oxygen as part of photosynthesis, right? I'm sorry, as part of respiration. But um, at the end of photosynthesis, they, they make oxygen. But plants are also... Um, and that's from absorbing what? What are they absorbing? They make oxygen, but they're absorbing CO2. And so they want to get dissolved oxygen into their roots too. So I'll put like an O2 down here. Now this tells me something, why, why they need dissolved oxygen. Um, you can't just stick a plant and dunk it into a bucket of water and expect that it's going to live because the water it's getting is not dissolved oxygen. It would just be drowning it, right, in H2O. I mean, there are aquatic plants, sure, but most plants will die and drown if you just sit them in a in a, in, in water, like, a you know, just in a bucket of water. And so plant roots getting aeration, being able to get some oxygen down to them, that's, an, that's just an important thing we want to keep in mind there. The plant roots also give the plant stability so that it doesn't tip over, right? And, you know, what if I were to take, what if I took a huge trash bag and put it over top of your head and told you to start breathing? What would happen? Yeah, eventually you're going to suffocate, right? Well, imagine this plant is sucking up a bunch of CO2 and it's making a bunch of oxygen, right? If there's no way to get that oxygen away from the plant surface as it's being, as it's coming out of the plant, Oxygen can actually start to suffocate the plant, right? So what do we often see in like some indoor gardening system or where is it a great place to put your, why is it not a good idea to put your garden right up against a solid fence? What do we need? Yes, we need air movement. Exactly. So they're going to they're gonna take the oxygen away from the surface of the plant. And allow it to continue to breathe, which is pretty cool. How about the temperature outside? What's a good temperature for the garden in the summer? Sure, we just don't want it to be freezing, right? And plants will do great from 85 to 90 degrees. 
really well right up there when that dirt's nice and warm. You know what I mean? But what about below the ground? What about once we go below ground? What's the ambient temperature of the earth? Right above, not the whole, not the earth, but just the, um, yeah, great, great. You know, 50 to 60 degrees underground is optimal because we know plants want to get dissolved oxygen. And I know when I boil water, right, when I see bubbles coming out of the boiling water, that's oxygen leaving the water, isn't it? Yeah. And so warm water does not hold oxygen. And so that's why it's important that the plant is the plant's roots are staying cool, even though the top part of the plant is staying warm. And the cooler we can keep the water, the more dissolved oxygen will be in that water uh, for when we when we're able to deliver it to the plant. Um, anything else you, you could tell me about what it takes to keep this plant growing? Yeah, so um, we do know that there has to be bacteria in the soil. I don't even know how I would draw bacteria, you know, but there's there's beneficial bacteria in the soil. Beneficial bacteria. Because as dead plant matter decompose, you know, decomposes, it's going to break down into consumable forms of nutrient for the plant, and it's beneficial bacteria that are going to break that down, you know. So, um, yeah, it's just a pretty good model of things the plant needs. And if you're a farmer, right, you're not getting paid every two weeks with a paycheck. You're going to get paid when you sell those crops. And so if the plant, if the, if the temperature were to drop down below freezing, right, a plant cell, which I believe plant cells have a double cell wall, don't they? Right. So the plant, a plant cell because it has this wall in the membrane here, which is full of water, when the temperature dips below 32 degrees, the water inside the membrane freezes and you get what's called lysing, uh, which is, uh, I think, right, that term? Exactly. Yep. Yep. And what if I got bugs flying around? What do I have to pay for? to keep my plants safe if I got bugs somewhere. A pesticide. What if I got a bunch of weeds growing everywhere? What if I got some, what if I got a bunch of uh, fungus growing in there? Fungicide. You know, and all these things cost money. And it used to be that, that if you wanted to kill weeds, right? You used to, they used to have to go around and, sh and, and shoot the weeds with the weed killer, but make sure they didn't hit the plant or else it would kill the plant. So there was no such thing as crop dusting because you couldn't dump something down on top of the whole crop. But as soon as Monsanto, right, which is the same company that apparently created Agent Orange for Vietnam, which was a, one of the many multiple colored agents that they created that would be a fast way to eliminate jungle cover in Vietnam so they could see what, what was going on on the ground. Uh, they are, are well known for having patented all these different genes and different, uh, chemicals, uh, exactly. And they made Roundup and Roundup's crazy because if you have a plant that was, that's, that was genetically modified to be resistant to the Roundup, it means you can cover the whole plant with Roundup. It won't hurt the plant, but it'll kill everything else around it, which allows them to do crop dusting. And it used to be, too, that when your plants got to a certain size, obviously, they go to seed, right? If you just let the plant keep growing through the season, whatever plant it is, it's going to end up starting to shoot seeds out. And that's how you collect that. You're supposed to collect those seeds and then use them, the best the seeds from the best plants to start your next crop next year. Well, when Monsanto came out with their genetically modified uh, soy and corn plants and everybody started to buy into them, they found out after you bought their seeds, because it's their intellectual property, you're not allowed to reseed next year with your own plants. You have to go back to Monsanto and buy new buy seeds from them. And if any of your seeds from your from your your farm were to happen to fly into a, your neighbor's farm and start 
growing there and they could take some leaves and test it and find out, they could say, you stole our, our intellectual property. Now you're either going to buy your seeds from us or we're going to sue your whole farm. And now that's how in a short period of time, Monsanto got 98%, you know, 90 some percent of the country forcefully onto their product. I'd imagine, yeah, yeah, they're checking to see if if, if you have any of their plants from their seeds grown on your property. Um, and another thing that they do, right, is it, on a, on a typical farm in South America, if you go on, you're looking for diversity of species. It's typical to find at least 200 different types of insect species floating around that that farm in the air. If you go into a typical farm in the U.S. that uses Monsanto, Roundup, and all this kind of thing, you're going to have less than 10 animal species, less than 10 insect species out there, which is crazy because it means all the biodiversity is gone, which means it's taking apart the, you know, ecosystem. You're pulling, you're pulling pieces out of that chain in the ecosystem. But these companies don't really care because they want to, they, they, you know, based on their technology that they implement, they feel like they solve a bunch of these other problems. But we know that technology always creates new problems, too. You can't escape that, right? So um, this is how the plant's going to grow. I guess the point I was going to make with all these things, pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, you know, you're going to have to pay for irrigation, right? For water. You're going to have to pay for labor. And all these things are costs. And guess what? If you mess up and your farm gets some virus or disease, or there's a natural disaster, or there's flooding, or there's a drought, whatever, you could wipe the whole crop out in one thing. And as you know, because you have family that work on farms, that's your salary for the year. Nobody, right? And so you're also going to be paying a ton of money for some type of crop insurance. All right, so these are just a few of the costs that go into it. All right, so we've got these issues outside. Like we can only grow outside during a certain number of months, right? We might only have three months of growing season out here in the summer. When we're using up, when we, whenever we irrigate with water, that water comes in, it, it percolates through the soil, but then we don't get it back, right? No. So I would say growing plant, plants are natural. Plants grow naturally. But when you make plants grow where you want them to so that you don't have to hunt and gather so that you can... You can you can farm right in your location. Agriculture. That's agriculture, and agriculture is a technology. All right. So hydroponics, we're going to go back to this model now. In hydroponics, we're still going to have a plant, but instead of germinating it in soil, and by the way, I didn't mention germination, but germination is just that process where a seed, a seed opens up and starts to turn into a sprout. And when seeds germinate, they actually don't really need much oxygen or any light. You can put them in a sealed Ziploc bag with some moisture and the plant will, will germinate. Um, but in hydroponics, instead of using soil, we're going to use some other medium. So this is, um, this is that rock wool cube that I had given you, right? That had a hole in it. And rock wool is made from basically rocks that have been heated up until they melted and then they spin them up with air and blow air through them like you'd make cotton candy out of rock sugar and they make the, they turn the stuff into these green fibers called rock wool it's also used as insulate as organic insulation but the point is that rock wool is inert meaning that it doesn't give off anything and it doesn't do any like it's not going to change the ph of your system the rock wool and rock wool isn't going to break down and add stuff or take stuff away from your closed system and, um, you know, a lot of hydroponic systems have some type of running water or moving water. And that's why soil is not going to work because soil is going to flush all over the place. This is what we start our seeds in. And so let's say we plant a seed inside here in one of these rock wool cubes. We've got some plant growing out of here. And if I could show you a picture of one of these, one of these cubes. Here's a tray with a bunch of rock wool cubes in it. 
and they come in a sheet and you can pull them off one at a time each one of those little cubes there you can see how they're they're holding the moisture in this picture you can see the moisture that's stuck inside there and um, if you go to the grocery store and you buy basil at the grocery store all right um, not the kind that you buy in a jar but if you buy it where it's still alive in one of those clear plastic bags by the tomato section that basil is all grown in a greenhouse hydroponically and if you open up that clear plastic bag and get down to what's what to, what the plant's actually growing out of it's growing out of one of these little green cubes of rock ball and so you could start your seedlings if you want to start a seedling in a piece of rock wool you can get from me you can order it online with that amazon wish list that's up there with the design challenge you could also just use folded up napkins or paper towels or a piece of cotton ball to start your seed in or you could just go to the grocery store and get one of those bags of basil and start with the whole plant all right so if this is my plant the plant's obviously going to still be growing roots like you mentioned, but if I'm bringing all the nutrients to the plant in hydroponics, if it's not going out to look for them, right, then the plant doesn't have to put as much energy into the roots and grow on the roots. It can put more energy into the top of the plant. Um, now from here, what do we need? Now imagine I'm bringing this whole thing inside now. So tell me how I can start recreating some of these other pieces to make this plant grow. So I'm going to need some type of a, we need some type of a light source. So maybe I could draw like a, a light source up here. Something that's, yeah, you get lumens in. So there's different types of grow lights out there. There's fluorescent bulbs. There's, um, uh, there's bulbs that like the ones in the parking decks that kind of glow orange or they glow a bluish color. Those are like serious lights, metal halide or high pressure sodium lights. Um, uh, and you also have the light coming in from your window, right? If you put this plant in front of a window. This is not to scale, obviously, but um, if, you go, if you're going to be putting your plant in front of a window, you're not going to get that whole 12 hours, 16 hours of sunlight, right? You're going to get sunlight, but the direct sunlight you're going to get is only going to happen when the zenith of the sun, that angle of the sun happens to be coming through that window and giving you some type of, of light. But it's not going to be as many hours of direct light, obviously, as if you're outside. So having some type of a grow light can be helpful. So like a regular old light bulb does not grow plants. you got to have a grow light of some kind. You can find them inside old aquariums, right? The, the aquarium light that lights up the bottom of your fish tank is a, is a grow bulb. Uh, you could buy grow bulbs that will that that go right into a regular socket. But even just getting it off the plant, the light coming in from the window is is a possibility to keep it growing. Okay, what else do we need? We need a place to um, we need something around this cube of rock wool because now these roots are growing out, and we don't want them exposed to the sunlight and the air. They're meant to be underground, cool, um, and so in hydroponics we usually have some type of cup or some other system around the cube that we can fill up with something that's not dirt. So there's other inert mediums besides the rock wool. And you'll see in some of those pictures where I have these clay pellets that look like cocoa puff cereal, but they're expanded clay. And the point of them is that they're not like hard rocks of like marbles or something. They're very light and porous. And the hydrocoral, these hydrocorals or hydroton or expanded clay, they're great because they stay nice and aerated, but they also hold on to moisture. And they give the roots something to grow into. Now, in a system with hydroponics, if we have a if we have a water reservoir somewhere, anywhere, again, not to scale, but let's say I have a, a tank down here with some water in it. I have to find a way to get the water to the plant, but I don't want to stick the whole plant in the water or it will drown. And so in some systems, you'll see a pump in the water. I'll put a P here for pump and maybe a cord coming out that plugs into the wall because it would need electricity, right? And this pump would pull water up and somehow deliver water to the plant so in some hydroponic systems there's a water pulls up and it drips water out so it's not drowning them water would drip in some systems 
the plants sit in a big gutter that's on an angle and as water pumps up to the top of the gutter it flows down the gutter and gets the plant plant roots wet as it goes there's other systems where the where the called flood and drain where the the plant sits inside of a big tray and the reservoir at the bottom five times a day just for a couple minutes though each time the water will pump up to the tray above and flood it but only for a couple minutes so it doesn't drown it and then the water will drain off after another couple minutes and then it'll stay dry for an a couple hours and then again flood and drain and so in all these types of systems we're finding different ways to deliver the water intermittently without drowning the plant um, and one great method if we don't have any 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 of these moving parts is to simply wick the water up and so if we have some type of a material like wool is a great wick cotton can work great but just fabric of some kind wrapped around this rock wool here if i went down inside the cup right through the middle and came out the bottom with pieces of white t-shirt or something like that and it was all wrapped around here what happens when you stick a paper towel into a puddle of water what is that scientific principle that that allows blood to flow up from our feet back up to our hearts and around our body what's that it's a type of action yep yeah it's capillary action i'm going to embarrass myself here i'm not trying to spell capillary i think it's c-a-p-p -P or c-a-p-i-l-l -L. capillary action though right is what allows that wicking to occur so we could have a wick attached to our plant and it could continuously be keeping the plant roots moist without drowning them we could eliminate having to have these pumps and stuff like that now in hydroponics because we're not in soil we have to add nutrient to the water and so people can add nutrients to the water um, with compost tea uh, organic stuff where you could also find liquid nutrients that are sold for hydroponics and you can mix them up and put them into the water another thing people will do if they if they don't want to do hydroponics is do aquaponics a q u a p o n i c s and in aquaponics, you just have to have some type of aquamarine life, whether it's frogs, turtles, fish, whatever. But you'll have some life form inside this tank. And when fish go to the bathroom, what's their waste? Do you know what the chemical symbol is for fish waste? Yeah, it's ammonia, right? I think it's NH4 or N NH4 is ammonia. So you get all this great nitrogen here, but how do you get that in a, in a form that's consumable for the plant? Because if you just take straight nitrogen and dump it on the ground or dump it on a plant, it's the pH is so high, it's going to burn the plant. Like if a dog or a cat pees on your front yard in the same spot every day, what happens to the grass? Yeah, it turns yellow because it's actually getting too much. It's too hot. It's yellow. It's getting too... Oh, you couldn't even see the picture I was drawing. Goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, you could? All right. Um. Uh, what was I saying? Um, it's so hot, and hot is just a term they use to describe a really high pH. And so what happens naturally with soil, there's denitrifying bacteria, there's beneficial bacteria, and in, and in water, like if there's rocks in this water or gravel, there'd be like a nice green slime or brownish slime that would develop on the coating of the rocks. That's denitrifying bacteria. That's good stuff. And so in a matter of hours, fish waste will get broken down by the beneficial bacteria and they will turn this NH4 into NO2 and I think NO3 minus. I have to look up those those symbols, but the point is it's 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 nitrite and nitrate, um, and that is the consumable form for the plant. But you can't get a lot of P and K in a system with with fish in it because phosphorus and potassium is not going to work out for the fish. But if you're going to grow leafy greens, collard greens, spinach, kale, all this stuff that's just a green vegetable all day long nitrogen with fish fish water. You don't have to have the P and the K. So this is some of the things that help make a hydroponic system run. We're almost done here, Jack. I'm gonna, sh yep, I'm gonna show you a picture now of a, of a soda bottle hydroponic system. And we'll see what it is that we start with as the base model for this design challenge and then we'll go over what the different requirements are that you're trying to solve and address um, 
ba 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 One second. Cool. So here's a picture of a soda bottle where the top of the soda bottle has been cut off from, you know, cut away from the bottom right around where the label is at the top. And the top of the soda bottle is flipped upside down and turns into its own cup for the, for the bottle. So from here, if I were to look at my picture here, I would have a, if I do this in like isometric, I've got this top of the soda bottle that's cut, turned upside down. Took the cap, the bottle cap off. And inside this cup here, you could put your rock wool cube kind of like right below the surface once you have a plant that's grown out of it. And then you can surround this cube. Well, you could wrap this whole cube up with t shirt strips or some other wicking material, pull it down through the cup, put the cup back into the two liter soda bottle, and there's the rest of it, right? And then you could fill the bottom of this reservoir up with a little bit of water. And as long as that wick's sitting in the water, water will rise up and keep the bottom of that plant moist through capillary action. Now, by itself, just like this, if I just sit this and I put it in front of a window, all right, I need some help because there's going to be problems here. Because if this sun, if this water at the bottom of the cup is exposed to the sunlight, what's going to grow in it eventually after a couple days? Yeah, you're going to get algae. And it's stagnant. I think I spelled stagnant, right? Stagnant water is water that's not moving. When it's not moving, it's not getting aeration. It's not being able to release its CO2. Um, and so what's another thing that's going to happen if it's sitting in the sunlight? And, and worse than that, it's in a clear bottle, which is, you know, when you sit in the car behind the windshield, and it's way hotter inside the car because the windshield's diffusing the light. Yeah, so, so this water down here is going to get, going to actually start to get hot. And what do we know about hot water? It doesn't hold dissolved oxygen. All right. So you got three sub problems here already. If you just start with this and you don't do something to protect the water, the water is going to get hot from the sunlight. If the water's not moving, it's going to go stagnant. And if it's getting hit by sunlight, it's going to grow algae. So that's your first issue is to solve for those things. How do we how do we hide this so that the plant's getting sunlight, but that the rest of it isn't? And then beyond that, we want it to be, you know, 80-some degrees up here right on top of the plant. But down here below, we want it to get as cool as we can. And so how do we keep the water from being stagnant? We have to find a way to agitate it, right? Agitate the water, move it around, shake it, find some way to create a subsystem that could allow you to move that water around. Now you could pick the whole bottle up and shake it, but is that as efficient as something else? Yeah, and you start getting down to like, well, what, what would be the, mo the e most efficient way to do it? And I've seen people come up with a thousand ideas for ways to stir that water up. It doesn't always have to be moving, but a couple times a day, it'd be great if you could move it. Um, you need to find some type of medium to put around these, around the rock wool. I think I gave you hydrocorals already, uh, but you could find other things besides dirt. Sand does not work well. It compacts with too much weight on the, on the plant roots. It doesn't let them get enough dissolved oxygen. Um, you want to find a way to check the water level. What's the level of the water? So that you need, so that you know if you need to add more water or not, you know. So, if I bring over another couple pictures, and we're just about done, Jack. Thank you so much for your time this morning. We make it over to your other class. You can see here in these pictures. I did this with some other kids for their morph chart. They were, you know, one row would be like, what's a way to wick water? What's a way to agitate the water? What are ways we can keep the water cool and not grow algae? 
what are ways we could change the water without dumping this whole cup and spilling the hydrocorals all over the ground? See, they have an idea with handles here or something. What's a way to take the plant out without the water spilling? And how do you reflect light onto this? So if there's any way to build something around this plant that can take that light coming in from the window and at the very least let it bounce back onto the plant before it just goes right by, you know, doing anything you can with to keep as much light as possible focused back on that plant since you're trying to utilize the minimum amount of light coming through the, sun, the window. Um, and so this is what like, like a morph chart look like, you know. Let's find another picture. So here's a student who's working on a way to check the level of the water. They're just getting started though. You can see their wick was wrapped around at the bottom, the hydrocorals, see how big this plant's growing. I had a cucumber plant one time that got 20 feet long and would suck up a whole liter of water every day just out of this bottle. And you gotta imagine the thing will start to get top heavy and it'll wanna tip over. So how do you keep that from happening? And there's no constraint on how big this can be or whatever. And you know, look at this one. They're, they're trying to hide their whole plant, blow into it as a way to make bubbles. There's a little grow light. The student's base system. There's a, one of those basil plants from the grocery store. They decorated their bottle too. Again, these are not, these haven't had anything done to them. This is just the base, the way everybody starts. Look at this kid's making a pump by squeezing the bottle to make air bubbles. There's a something to insulate, a handle up at the top. And you know, if we were doing this as like a science experiment, we could have two of them. We could have one sitting there, one bottle with nothing done to it and see how that one grows and then see how your system grows. You don't have to do that. But so you're just going to be designing these subsystems to solve these sub problems and then trying to design multiple subsystems to go around the bottle. And then you build the thing and start growing it. And your testing is different than other people's testing. You know, you're not going to be able to test like crush a bridge, see how much weight it held, right? This is not a test where you get data back that fast. You have to sit there and let the plant grow every day. And over the course of a week, weigh how much does the plant matter weigh? Is it, has it grown new plant matter? How much water is it sucking up? What's the temperature inside the bottle? You know what I mean? Uh, well, yeah, leafy greens in the start. You know, cucumbers work great. Basil works great. And I recommend, like I said, you, you, you try this with the basil from the grocery store, but I, you know, you can also try starting some seeds. Different people had a cool idea, like a jacket that comes on and off this thing with Velcro. Or I saw some of the dipstick, like checking the oil in your car where you could check the water level inside. There's one of those gutter systems with the plants in the gutter. The water pumps up from the fish tank and then comes down the gutter and then pours back in. It's me over in Philadelphia. Now, if you go inside the folder for this activity, there's a bunch of different versions of the design brief, but I think that in the main column on the table, I the the stuff that I put there is, you know, the stuff is generally matches what I just said here about maximizing the amount of light on the sun, checking the water level, keeping the water cool, keeping the water from growing algae, keeping the bottle from tipping over, being able to change the water, being able to um, uh, keep the water from going stagnant, agitating. So if you look in that shared folder, it's gigantic. You know, you don't have to get overwhelmed going through stuff in there. I mean, it's basically just from this lesson, what I talked about, you creating subsystems to solve these sub problems. And um, I think I'll put one more picture in the video. We'll say goodbye. And it's for
somebody made this up one time. Aeration, monitoring the water, regulate the temperature, stable base. We didn't say anything about pH regulation, but people can raise and lower pH with baking soda or lemon drops. And when it comes to the size of the bottle, I just wanna show this one last picture here. Yeah, how cool is that? Look at that, like a fifth grader made up this dipstick system. So cool. There we go. Here's all the little subsystems you could go after. Balance in the base, safety, removing the top, changing the water, keep the water cool, keep the water agitated, check the water level, capture sunlight, wicking material, inert aggregate material inside. And this is a little picture of in 2D of what the bottle could look like with dimensions here. Again, I don't care how wide you go or how much it weighs or anything like that. This, you know, filling it up to about a third of the way at the bottom of the water. You know, it helps to take water and let it sit out for 24 hours before you expose it to the plant because then the chlorination inside the water will evaporate. All right, Yako. I enjoyed this this morning. Thanks for meeting up with me for this lesson.